So let's take a look at the different types of classic sedimentary rocks that we can see. We looked at how these rocks form, so now let's break them down into the different types. There's going to be many different types of classic sedimentary rocks, but I'm just going to show you the big categories. And the way that we're going to break them down is by grain size. Okay, so that's important. So let's go ahead and start with our big grains. So we're going to start with our gravel sized grains. And our gravel sized grains are going to come in two varieties. The first is going to be if they're highly angular. So physically meaning the, the grain itself, the piece of gravel, has lots of, say, angles on it. So if you take a look at these big pieces down here, these guys are kind of walking over. Right, they've got lots of angles right on there, lots of high angles, lots of sharp, jagged corners. We call this type of rock breccia. Okay, so breccia is made up of angled, graveled sized pieces. When this gets lithified, you can see over here the picture on the right. Um, okay, so it's encased in smaller particle material that's formed a rock itself, but you can still see that these grains, right, are definitely highly angular. They have lots of angled edges. We tend to find these at, say, the base of a mountain, right, or the talus pile that you can see here under a cliff as the material starts to erode. But this tells me when I find these angled pieces that that rock is close to where it formed. It hasn't traveled at all, right? It hasn't undergone that rounding process, right? So it's highly angled. So angled, growled sized pieces is called breccia. On the other hand, if it's rounded, okay, gravel sized pieces. So here, if you take a look at the picture um, on the left, right, we've got these nice rounded sized pieces. When it's lithified, you can see definitely nice and well-rounded here. That well-rounded rock we call conglomerate. Okay, So this is just telling me that this material has traveled in the river, right? All of those highly angular edges have broken off, so it started out as a breccia, as it traveled down the river and hit the sides of the river and the bottom of the river and other rocks, those big angles have knocked off, right, over time, making it nice and well-rounded. Moving down to a smaller size particle, um, if we can have, uh, and, and I'm, I'm gonna actually going to disagree with this, it's not gra gravel size, just sand. Um, so Arcos, let's get rid of this, I, I don't agree with your author there at all. Arcos is a sand that has at least 25% feldspar in there. So sand is a smaller particle size, right? Guarantee you've all seen sand before, nice and little. Um, so it's got at least 25% feldspar in there. And if you can see, all that feldspar gives it that pink color. When I see feldspar in there, that's telling me that that rock isn't very mature. It hasn't been beaten out by the water system yet. Um, as What happens is as these rocks erode and they break down, most of the minerals undergo a process called hydrolysis, and they turn into clay. Um, and really the only mineral that's going to remain over time that's not going to break down is going to be quartz. I remember good old quartz with its hardness of seven. Um, so if I see a lot of feldspar in there, they're telling me that that sand is pretty young. It hasn't been in the water system for a long time. So we tend to find this at alluvial fans. Alluvial fans are basically like little deltas that you can see here form at the base of our mountains. So sandstone, in general, is a rock made of sand-sized particle. Quartz is usually the most common type. So when we find that, we call it quartz sandstone. And quartz sandstone is usually white in color because it's got all that quartz in there. So if you've ever been to Pensacola Beach, you've definitely seen quartz sandstone, nice and white. Moving down into the two last smaller particle sizes, uh, we have silt and clay sized particles. Um, silt sized particles forms a rock that we call silt stone, okay? And clay sized particles uh, form a rock we can, and again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna disagree with your author here on this. We're either gonna call shale or clay, and, and, and I'm gonna tell you the difference here in a second. But first of all, silt and clay are too small to be seen with the naked eye. 
Um, gravel and sand is easy to tell the difference between. Silt and clay is very tough. You can't see the individual pieces. You can take it back to the lab and measure it um, with varying different ways, with a sediment shaker or, or with a laser. Um, but really the easiest way when you're out in the field to tell the difference is to lick the rock. If you feel grit in between your teeth, then you know the particle sizes are a little bit bigger and it's silt. If you lick the rock and you don't feel those little tiny particles, then it's clay. Now, uh, clay-sized particles can do one of two things. It can either form a shale, and a shale breaks down into these sheets. So you see how it kind of forms these nice little layers here. So when you, when you look at it, it kind of falls apart like pages of the book. Again, I, I don't like that the author used this. We call this clay stone. Um, clay stone doesn't break apart into those sheets. It just kind of breaks apart into, into big bits. Um, and here's where I'm going to disagree with your author, because mud is actually equal parts silt and clay. All right, so it's the two grain sizes mixed together. That's what actually makes mudstone. Um, but what we tend to see in general is that those finer materials, like the silt and clay, are going to get deposited where the water isn't moving very much, so quiet water. Um, and that should make sense, right? Those bigger particles are heavy, they can fall to the bottom in quickly moving water. In order to get those smaller pieces deposited, that water's got to be nice and still, right, for that material to kind of move down to the bottom. So what's kind of great is this really gives us kind of a key to understanding different environments. So let's say I'm in the middle of Kansas, and I find a huge clay layer from 200 million years ago. Well, that tells me 200 million years ago, Kansas was covered by a deep ocean, right? And there was lots of quiet water, or a deep lake at least, right? It's not a deep ocean, where all that material can settle down to the bottom and get deposited. So this is what's great about sedimentary rocks, especially those clastic rocks, is they tell us about the environment in which they formed. So it allows us to recreate environments over time. Now, a lot of these quiet water settings, um, have lots of organic rich material and we're going to get to that in one of the later videos. Now some of these beautiful mixes that we can get, uh, we can get a dimictite, which a dimictite is where we've got large pieces of gravel mixed with mud. Okay, Usually we find this definitely in glacial till, so where glaciers have been, you have these big rocks mixed with mud. Um, and then a wacky, we actually usually call this a gray wacky. A gray wacky is sand, uh, usually too many rocks, but sand and silt and clay all mixed together. And usually we find this out in, in the deep ocean. But what's really important about our clastic rocks is, like I said, they really give us those clues to help understand um, how they were deposited. So we can really talk about their maturity if we go back to this, some of the stuff we talked about in class. So the maturity is basically how long this rock has been around, either a short time or a long time. We can talk about textural maturity, which is how round the grains are or how well sorted it is. So if I find a rock that has very small grain sizes and the, the grains are really well rounded and all well sorted, well it tells me it's really mature, it's been around for a long time. If I find a rock that has big pieces and they're highly angular and it's all the sizes are mixed together, well that's a pretty new, new sediment pile. We can also talk about mineral maturity, right? Um, so as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, most of your other minerals um, turn into clay over time. Really all we see left is quartz. Quartz is the mineral that kind of withstands most of the weathering and erosion process. So uh, if I'm looking at a rock like you can see down here, um, we start out with a whole bunch of minerals in there. As time goes on, and it, by the time it ends up to the beach, you see we end up with only quartz. So that tells me, right, when I look at a rock and I see that it's predominantly quartz, that it's actually been there for quite a long time, so it's very mature. 